you know, the Stanford and in Lund. He had a guest professorship at Dies in Hamburg. He became full professor at uh, KTH uh, in uh, material physics. It was KTH, right? Good KTH. <laughs> but I mean, I'm getting confused because he was also at uh, some later point uh, uh, president of the University of uh, Bing, but of course also president of the University of uh, KTH. Um, Anders also is uh, and was secretary of the Technical Research Council here in Sweden before it uh, united into what is now known as VR. He was prefect at physics in K uh, KTH before he became president at the KTH in 1999 through 2007, which is the time when he became uh, the head of Höchstkohl uh, Berget, which is the uh, Swedish National Agency for Higher Education. So Anders will talk today about the question free universities. And okay, thank, thank you. Thank I forgot one thing, of course, uh, that Anders is also the board member of Nordita, and of course uh, he was uh, very important in getting us survive uh, and come here to Sweden, which is uh, one of the big things we are very grateful for. So, Anders, please. Thank you. Yes, I will end up in, uh, in uh, free universities. I will uh, discuss uh, what you could call Swedish and uh, a bit of uh, European research policy uh, at the moment. And uh, uh, right now I'm uh, involved in, in, uh, in a board and an executive committee for uh, something called the European Institute of Innova Innovation and Technology, EIT, which uh, was the uh, idea of uh, President Barroso to make European more competitive towards the U.S. top universities. And uh, well, you know, as many politicians, European politicians, he visited the U.S. and he visited MIT. He got very impressed, and uh, uh, he said immediately that uh, Europe needs this to be able to to catch up uh, when it comes to industrial uh, development, coupled to economic growth, because he saw. A lot of both uh, great uh, basic science, but also some very good uh, applied science down there. And uh, the story also tells that uh, one other reason was that uh, you know the European Parliament goes between Strasbourg and Brussels, and uh, they were very tired of moving. Uh, both their personal belongings and all their files. Uh, every six months, so uh, this should also be a deal to move the European Parliament uh, to, uh, to Brussels and Strasbourg should be the place for the new uh, European Institute of, of Technology and should that way compensate the Strasbourg for the loss of politicians that should get the best scientists in Europe being there. True or not, but uh, he really pushed this idea. And, uh, and I think one of the reasons pushing this type of idea right now in Europe is that uh, uh, the European Council of Ministers, <coughs> Parliament, uh, and the President Barroso thinks very much that uh, the Commission is a, is a very bureaucratic uh, place, and the Commission tries to ex. Uh, exert too much power in uh, in research and higher education policies, uh, so uh, so it's simply too strong. And one reason to break up the strengths of the Commission is try to uh, get new European institutions separate from the Commission, run by independent boards, and having a very clear tasks. Uh, and the first uh, try. Or the, in this uh, different trials, we will we will see also in the future was the European Research Council, and you know now it, it was there has been through then we had first in the European Research Council 
uh, for young investigators and now we have had one for uh, older investigators and uh, you can see that it's really making a change. I mean some very good people at different European countries get uh, research resources, uh, of substantial research resources and I think you can call uh, the European Research Council already now a success. So this uh, Institute of Technology was then meant not only to mimic MIT, but also to make a similar success, not only promoting research, but also promoting uh, higher education and research and innovation. And uh, if you're out in this bureaucracy where I, where I live right now, you, you can hear every second minute when you discuss the, you compete, uh, how, how Europe should compete, about the knowledge triangle. So if anyone says to you, the knowledge triangle is important for, the, for Europe to get the economic growth, to catch up with the US, to become more entrepreneurial, you should just not, because there's nothing else than uh, the old idea that you need to, to connect higher education to research, <coughs> and if you, want the, if, if you want the ideas from the university to be transmitted out in society, it's either done by research results that's used in, in some sort of companies, or it's young people coming out with a PhD or with a master degree that transfer it, so it's nothing else. But these are the two examples of, of uh, a new trend in Europe. And uh, it's quite interesting to, uh, to be a member of this type of, of board because uh, you learn the cultures of the different countries involved. And to make it even more difficult to get this thing moving, uh, since Strasbourg was not accepted, uh, the idea is to uh, try to have distributed campuses, and it couldn't be called campuses, it's called knowledge integrated communities, and they should have, they should be placed at, uh, at different uh, universities in Europe. And the first time we had a board meeting, uh, we, we had uh, got a budget for 308 million euros, which is about the one quarter of the budget we, 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 shall, or we should have. And uh, then uh, we all got, we first, there was a talk to her and they said that you're fully autonomous to decide what area you want to promote with these knowledge communities. You can make your own choice, you're 18 uh, people that know uh, research in Europe uh, fairly well, so you can make a, a good choice. And then after, after that first talk, there was the next talk by Barros himself, he said you have, you have uh, Full, autonomous, uh, full autonomy to decide, but it cannot be more than three areas, he said. And then there was a talk by the uh, Commissioner Figuel, and his, uh, his talk, he said that you have full autonomy, it should be three areas, and the three areas should be climate, energy, <laughs> and future ICT. And so, and so that was the full autonomy in this case. So uh, what we are doing right now is for these three first areas is that, that we actually trying to, to set up uh, processes to be able to judge proposals uh, for this. Hopefully, when we get the full budget, there will be another three areas and hopefully we will be able to, uh, to get uh, then have a freer choice uh, in this case. But uh, you know, I mean, uh, when you look at the budget like this and you look at the technical university, a uh, European technical university, it will be a substantial force in this case. And if, if you look in uh, what's happening in Sweden, I mean, uh, you could foresee that uh, Stockholm University would be a strong uh, a strong actor or a strong node within climate research, you could foresee that uh, KTH could be a similar strong node within ICT research. It's actually uh, many Swedish universities that uh, could uh, benefit from uh, this type of, uh, of uh, new university. But uh, the story of setting up this uh, university like this and get a decent budget is the same story also like <coughs> researchers have. 
I mean, you have to multiply the money. So it's also the idea that uh, these 308 should be multiplied locally by another 308 million euros from different uh, local funding. And it should also be multiplied by the industrial funding with another 308. So, I mean, uh, my, you are counting on that uh, the activities uh, should be a factor of three, four more than the, than the European, uh, European financing. And uh, so that's sort of uh, one of the things I'm, uh, I'm trying now to, uh, to promote, uh, being independent, but uh, trying to promote to get uh, a good uh, Swedish uh, participation. And uh, this will, in a sense, uh, be a, a completely new university. Then the interesting part is that the Universities where these uh, kicks are going to be placed are very positive to get the research there, but they are very anxious not to that this new university should be able to give out the, their own PhD and the master degrees. So those should be given out by the host universities. Uh, so that's uh, uh, part of, of uh, the European scheme. The other thing I'm uh, presently starting to get more and more involved in is what's going to happen with the, uh, the Swedish infrastructure uh, concerning research and uh, you are pro probably read that uh, there is now uh, fairly close for a decision to put the European spallation source uh, in, uh, in Lund uh, in Sweden and uh, the problem we have right now then, of course, in Sweden is that uh, the other major infrastructure within uh, physics in Sweden is MaxLab uh, and the suggestion for a Max4. And uh, together this is, uh, is of course, a uh, very strong force together, but uh, at the same time the financing of Max4 is sort of not coming fully and uh, people st st start thinking about what's going to happen actually in the synchrotron radiation area should it be something else and uh, uh, probably there is a window of opportunity for uh, free electron laser uh, research and uh, since uh, we have a strong free electron laser group working with X-ray free electron laser group at Hauselab uh, uh, in Germany, this would be a time for researchers in the Stockholm Uppsala region to talk, start think about not uh, a Max 4 type concept, which still is a conventional synchrotron in some sense, synchrotron radiation source in some sense, but try to look a bit ahead and see if. Uh, one could set up a reasonable, uh, strong collaboration with the XFEL and perhaps on a 15-20 years perspective develop uh, a facility in the, uh, in the Stockholm uh, Uppsala region. I think this would be, uh, would be quite possible because I think what will happen with the technology around the free electron lasers, it will be simplified, it will uh, go the same way as in duration sources, so we would be able to do it with the, in, with the reasonable resources. And uh, I'm now trying to get a bit more involved in this part. But uh, the main reason I, I was interested to come here is to give you sort of a picture of what's happening in the, with the Swedish universities and university colleges. So, and you know, all know that uh, 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 a few weeks ago we, we got a new, new research proposal <coughs> for the coming years and uh, it was uh, for the first time in 10 years it was really uh, more money than expected or less money than expected because uh, uh, the government has said that uh, they should reach uh, uh, one percent of the of the GDP should be allotted to uh, to research, and that corresponded to an increase of the governmental research budget with 10 billion Swedish crowns. 
in reality it became 5 billion of Swedish crowns and instead they did the calculation for this 1% in a new way. So it was 5 billion meant 1%, not 10 billion. Uh, but still it's, uh, it's about twice as much as usual in this research proposal. So it really is very much more money and all the university chancellors, uh, vice chancellors I meet are very positive. I think that this is really, will be uh, sort of a, an increased research in Sweden. But what's more interesting is the structure of this money because uh, it is decided that uh, of this new 5 billion uh, 1.8 billion should be distributed to the university based on what's called scientific quality. And uh, scientific quality is defined in two ways. It's defined as bibliometrics, which means that productivity in citations will, uh, will uh, be one indicator which makes out 50% of, uh, of, uh, of the money and uh, the other indicator uh, will be how much uh, external money uh, does the university earn, which make up the other 50%. And uh, if you make this algorithm, where you, you get this, uh, you distribute this 1.8 billion, you do immediately see that the winners are the, are the major universities in this country and uh, much less winners uh, still getting more money are the university colleges and the new universities, I mean the brand new ones. In. So in 2010 the government will bring in another 10% of the, uh, of, the, of the research budget to the faculties into this algorithm. So that will further enhance the possibilities for the major universities. So in a sense we are now building up the major universities to be, a, to be competitive in a, in, a, in a worldwide sense. And uh, if you look at the KTH it means uh, next year an extra 100 million crowns in faculty money, similar numbers for Stockholm universities and the big winner as it's been the last years in Sweden is Lund University where it means where it's an extra 250 million in the yearly, yearly budget. So, so now it's time for so, 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 sort of a, on a research level to start to plan, I mean, how should we use this money to focus and become even better, I mean, when this, uh, this algorithm will be used again and again. But the other part of this increase is, is uh, even more interesting and it's uh, it really uh, applies uh, or is a really new way of, uh, of distributing research money. The government has from a political uh, set of reasons defined what they call 22 strategic areas within medicine, engineering and science and the climate and energy science. And those 22 areas uh, they will, uh, they will have a bit above, uh, close to 3 billion uh, money, uh, sort of uh, Swedish krona distributed to these 22 areas. And uh, hopefully, uh, or let's put it this way, all the universities are now looking for making applications for the money in these areas. And these applications will be judged by uh, the usual uh, national funding agencies, VR, uh, VINOVA and the other uh, research councils. And it, it's, uh, it's going to be really interesting to see because the areas within this, I mean the research within these strategic areas will have uh, really substantial new uh, resources. And if you if you read the, there is a Swedish paper for, uh, for management called Dagens Industry and today 
some of the more important industrial people in Sweden have a hard time that this, this money within these strategic areas should be distributed in a full academic way to the university. So they claim that this money must be distributed also taking into consideration the views of different, uh, different industries in Sweden. <coughs> and uh, you can have a joke about it because if you look at the Swedish research in general, it's about 4% of the GDP that's spent on research. And uh, roughly it's 1% spent by the government, as we discussed. It's 1% spent by Ericsson. It's 1% spent by AstraZeneca. And then all, uh, all other industries in Sweden uh, share the, the, the last percent. So, of course, they are very interested to get hold of this money because that would be uh, a way to strengthen their research without uh, having to put in uh, any money themselves. So, we'll see this discussion going on. But hopefully this will be a, a fully academic process. But this process will further strengthen the major universities. So we are really go coming into a, a landscape uh, of Swedish universities where the major universities will really be the major universities and all university colleges and the new universities, they will have to focus on much, uh, much uh, narrower areas to be able to keep the excellence to, to survive in the research way. And uh, so this is sort of a, of a bit uh, of, uh, well, it, it's a bit of trouble, I mean, for, uh, for those universities who once uh, they became new universities to be able to build up to become a major universities and now they are hit in the head by this uh, way of distributing. So this will also co cause a lot of fuss. In this new policy, I mean, to, to, uh, uh, to increase the, major, the importance of the major universities, there are also now a discussion and there will be a, a committee putting forward a proposal for changing the status of uh, all Swedish universities. I mean, right now, you know, the Swedish universities are in a sense, one big university, the old part of the, of the, of the government. Uh, and the new idea is that this idea, we will quit having the universities and government, as governmental uh, agencies. They should become free in, uh, in, in some sense. And then you can ask yourself, what is freedom uh, in this case? And if you look at the... Uh, at, for example, Finland, the same idea to become competitive in Europe, distributing money in, in a similar way and make the universities free, so that type of policy is also a Finnish policy. And, uh, but in Finland, it's done in a much more top-down way. Uh, it's decided that in Helsinki there should only be two universities. So three universities, including the Helsinki University of Technology, is put into one university. In Åbo, it should only be one university. So the, the Swedish and Finnish university, Swedish-speaking and the Finnish-speaking university in Åbo is put into one university. And for Eastern Finland, there is also created one university. But those universities are also financed as free universities. They are becoming foundation universities like Chalmers and, and Jönköping. So, so they get the greater sort of responsibility in the Finnish system. I don't think this will happen in Sweden. I think free here would mean uh, not connected directly to the government, but uh, somehow still be connected uh, to the government. And perhaps... Uh, uh, there will be some resources connected to it, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very sure. And then, of course, you can, uh, you can start thinking about what, uh, why should you have this type of freedom, because I think a freedom not connected to having enough resources yourself to be able to do what you want in a certain sense and not be connected on a yearly basis 
for all your resources to the government is uh, some, some sort of a, of a, of a, of a semi, semi freedom. Uh, so, but still, it's it's uh, it's kind of interesting, and it's kind of interesting for my agency having the quality control because, uh, you know, today we have a quality control of this university system. Then we should have a quality control of different in individual universities, and it would probably be like having the quality control of a telecom op of the telecom operators. We will. We will uh, allot frequency bands to the different universities. So we will allot physics research to one university, chemistry research to another, and nothing else. I mean, so it would be a, it will be a more contract way of, of handling this situation if it if it happens. Uh, the reason I believe it won't happen is, of course, that we will have a new election in two years, and I don't think. Uh, the present government would risk that it's another government and everything is turned, uh, turned around again in two years from now. So I think probably this, uh, to see it as free, uh, to become free universities in, in an economic and a government uh, governance way, uh, uh, will have to, to wait a, a bit in Sweden. If you look at the other plus changes we will see uh, in, uh, in the coming years and different proposals that will influence the life in universities. Uh, probably the second most important after uh, the possibility of free universities that we will also have a proposal on new ways of careers in the, in the universities. And, this is, uh, uh, I can, in a way, a, a, uni a universal problem. If you look at the U.S., who has been able to foster great science generations using the tenure track to sort of uh, uh, weed out the people that shouldn't become tenure and get the best uh, uh, scientists and teachers to get, to have tenure. Uh, today in the U.S., the, ten, uh, the tenure track system is there are less than 50% uh, of the people employed at, in, as researchers and teachers at universities has actually been through a tenure track system. It's a bit more at Stanford, MIT uh, than the biggest one, but it's going down all the time. If you look in Sweden, it's uh, also less than 50% that have, a, have an academic career pass. And uh, I think uh, what uh, will happen here is that we're going to try to revive an academic career path in Sweden. We're going to try to to see that we that it really means something uh, in in the future, and hopefully we will get that change. Because personally, I believe that the the way the system is going right now, not having a, a proper uh, academic career path controlled by a faculty and controlled by experts in, in, uh, in appointing professors, we will lose our, uh, lose our ability to, to really create people in our own scientific profession. I mean, you need that type of, of uh, judgment about what people are suitable to be able to keep the professional, uh, I mean, to, to keep us the best uh, as professionals in, in this way. But here there is going to be a fight, I believe, because I met all the uh, vice chancellors and they, of course, want to, uh, they have a completely other attitude. Their attitude, if, if I joke a bit about this, that there is a brilliant scientist walking by on the street and the rector looks out and sees this brilliant scientist and he decides I want to hire this scientist and then he should be able to go out on the street take up his, uh, his uh, form and say, please sign here and you're hired, and then he would write in, in the money. And that, would, that is called flexi <coughs> flexibility and, uh, and uh, grabbing the opportunities when they appear. And there should be some kind of possibility to do this, but I think it should be very restricted. But uh, we are also waiting for that type of, uh, of uh, proposal to be given. And the final one that will influence all of us is, of course, that uh, uh, we probably will see a proposal that uh, we would 
we will uh, enter a tuition fee system in, uh, in Sweden. And by tuition fee system, I mean that uh, there will be tuition fees for all students coming from countries outside uh, Europe. And, uh, and uh, if that is good or a bad thing, uh, you could uh, debate. I mean, if you look at many students coming from these countries, even the, uh, even the good ones, many put up as a reason to come to Sweden is that the uh, higher education is free. I mean, so, so in a way we attract some very good students. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we had a scholarship system and could make a better selection, we would uh, probably be happier. But I think uh, uh, the choice is not scholarship or, uh, or free higher <coughs> education. I think if we get tuition fees, I don't think we will get any scholarships. So I think uh, we should try to, to, uh, try to keep uh, the, the higher education free in Sweden because I think that really means that we will still be attractive for some uh, very, good, very good students. So that's sort of a, a, a picture of what's going on politically uh, concerning uh, <coughs> higher education uh, and uh, and the research uh, in Sweden and uh, finally you can which worries me and uh, I don't know about you is that uh, these increased resources for research are not followed up by increased resources for higher education we will still have a rather uh, tough situation I mean when it comes for higher education uh, and that goes both for, uh, for science and engineering, uh, uh, undergraduate and, and graduate studies. And uh, it, we will, in a sense, turn the universities one step closer to a research institute uh, attitude. And uh, uh, hopefully this will not be true. Hopefully there will also be increased resources for higher education. But uh, it's very, very quiet from uh, uh, the government concerning uh, new resources uh, in, uh, in this case. So I hope I've given you some uh, picture of what's going on uh, in, in a political sense and that uh, uh, we will get uh, uh, some sort of a proposal for free universities, but uh, I don't believe it will actually be realized in a sense. So I think we, it's better that we talk to each other. So I'll see. Thanks, Thank Anna. you. See what the Tom reform did to, to uh, this, the, the professor reform under Carl Tom. It's decreased the mobility. And this, I think, long been recognized as difficulty to achieving a better standard of excellence in science in Sweden. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think uh, the, the reform, I mean, uh, of uh, being able to promote professors at the universities where you are making your academic career is has definitely diminished the mobility uh, and uh, caused a loss of, uh, of quality. I mean, uh, it, uh, and you know, I mean, I think the major problem with the uh, promotion system, the Swedish promotion <coughs> system, is that uh, uh, it has no limits. If you go, for example, to Burke in the US, it's also promotion system. I mean, you are promoted uh, from uh, assistant to associate to full to, to share in some sense, but it's decided by the university, faculty and management, how many positions you should have on each level. So, I mean, uh, so it's not an automatic thing that you, 
you just uh, give in your uh, your curriculum and someone say you are a professor and uh, there is no limits on it. So I think. But I think the main difference is that they don't promote their own students, and that's what we do here. Yeah. And they don't do that in Germany either. I don't know so much about France and Italy, but I feel that's a barrier to achieving a certain yeah openness in an academic atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. But still, I mean, well, I, still I believe that. Uh, I mean, if you go 20 years back in Sweden, when we didn't have a promotion system of the professor, we had the reasonable mobility on the on the professor yeah. level. But I think the mobility on the uh, uh, research associate or postdoc level is is in a way more important today than the professor mobility. But uh, I, well, I, I don't. You know this better than I do. Okay. I mean, we have a great amount of mobility in the UK, and I think that's because of the research assessment exercises, uh, which allow the departments themselves to gain a lot of money if they uh, are ranked higher in the next uh, RAE. And so they consider this as an opportunity to go out really onto the street from the departmental level and, and to uh, grab the best people elsewhere in the country or from abroad. And that's something we won't, we don't have here, nor are we likely to have it here, especially not if you're saying that universities should be merged, which means that the inter-university university competition would decrease even further. Yeah, but if you look at the, pre at the new system of distributing resources, which is based on uh, academic qualities like citation productivity and external money, of course, uh, if you, you could, perhaps see the same development here. You discover some uh, great professor in Lund and uh, Stockholm and uh, KTH goes together and say, well, let's get this girl or guy come to uh, here and we are, we are uh, actually putting up the resources because we know we will gain the resources. So perhaps we will see a bit of this. And this is one of the things that the new universities really fear now, because when they see this money floating into the old universities, they believe that there will be a scouting from the old universities for some of the excellent groups that are distributed uh, in country. And uh, I guess that's also kind of a good mobility, I don't know. It's not fair, but it's, it's mobility at least. Not very Swedish, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's take Anders first. But I think the mobility on the senior level is fairly low in the US also. It's very hard to recruit older people. I think it's good if you can do it. But I think the real problem with the Swedish system is how you hire young people. And that very often positions are not openly announced. You are not going for the very best, trying to attract the best people. You very often create positions by a narrow announcement. Mm -hmm. You have a person who has some external support to create a position for that person. I think that's a, that's a big problem. That's a really big problem. So what should be the way of avoid this? I mean, we have uh, younger researchers uh, sort of uh, not connected to a, a specific university, but uh, they apply in competition to VR. Should that be uh, increased? So, I mean... Uh, well, I think it has also to, to be done within the universities. One, I mean, we have a system where positions are supposed to be very openly announced in the fair competition. But we all know that there are many ways of using this system so it doesn't work that way. And uh, I don't have one, I don't know a solution to that. And it varies very much in different universities and in different faculties. But maybe a little open discussion about uh, an awareness of this and looking into it. Uh, Hans? So it's basically a little bit of the same theme, and that is how you ensure that the system in some sense is fair, so that you really go for the good ones. And I think that any one here that's been long enough in the system has seen examples of twisting the rules, nepotism, etc. And as a concrete example, there was a rather interesting article in August Nihet uh, uh, about Karolinska Institute, um, I think about a week or two ago. And it was a not very convincing answer by the president of the university. But what I want to ask is, 
you are now sitting in a position where you oversee the university. Is there any any thoughts about how to react in cases like this? Is there any thoughts of establishing some kind of more uh, more powerful way of dealing with, perhaps not this case, because you shouldn't judge before you know all the facts, but we all know that these things do exist. Yeah. No, I, it's interesting that you, you say this because uh, I've had some uh, mail uh, exchange with the uh, email exchange with people pointing out uh, what happened there and uh, we are going to look into it uh, if it's been uh, mismanaged in a formal way and then I mean in a formal way I mean if they've been broken if, uh, if the law of university law uh, or the prescriptions for the universities has been uh, those rules have been broken in some way, but very often they are handled in a clever, formal way. And, the, and then, from one of the email uh, emailers, uh, they told me that uh, I should become like amnesty. I, I should embarrass uh, these uh, presidents that were doing this because they are they are harming the system without breaking any rules. And uh, but it should be in a public way one should uh, point out. And I think this debate you see in Dagens Nyheter between uh, what's happening in KI is, I think it really matters that that debate is, is public. So, but, but very often when I look into it with the lawyers I have, I mean, uh, it's done in a way that uh, formally it's very hard to, uh, to, to say this is, this is not allowed. And uh, if you look at some of the intentions in this uh, committee proposal from Anne Umhauser in Lund, who was responsible, in, uh, if they are sort of getting into the new uh, law for uh, hiring and academic careers, uh, this will be allowed. Uh, I mean, there, there, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a chance that we really will dilute, I mean, the acad academic career has even more. I mean, I think your definition of a free university was somewhat unusual. <laughs> to, to me, uh, a free university is a place where each grant holder is allowed to decide himself what problems to choose, and not being forced into one of those boxes of climate and ICT. Do, do you think uh, there will be some uh, share of research councils funding research for such questions? Uh, to be honest, uh, no. I mean, I think uh, uh, there is uh, there is so much feedback in the system that uh, when you decide about having strategic areas in a in a political sense, it's not. I mean, it's not. It's based. These twenty two areas are based on the wishes or the proposals or the strategies submitted by the different universities in Sweden. So the government has looked at uh, the KTH uh, strategic plan for how KTH want to become an excellent uh, research university in the future, they looked at Lund and all this. And then the, the people have been uh, putting this together and uh, then they have uh, they have looked at it and said that these are the 22 most important strategic areas based on what the universities believe that the research future should, should, should look like. Uh, so, uh, and once you have these 22 and they will get money, the rectors or the universities then will get this free faculty money. They will of course put them into these strategic areas too because if they do they get more money. So the system will feed back itself. And uh, so I mean the spirit of freedom is also, must also be within the university. There are 14 big universities, uh, 14 universities and 22 universities and colleges in Sweden. You know how many had sustainable development in the concerning uh, climate and energy of these 36? 
all surfaces. All surfaces consider that to be uh, the most important focus area. <laughs> so, uh, so freedom is also a spirit uh, inside the, the university. You, you, uh, so, but uh, I, I, I mean, I agree with you. I would, I, I would love to see a free university like that, but I don't think we will ever see it again. Yeah, just a, a, a comment for, for, for both of these arguments being raised. I mean, uh, also coming back to an appointment. I mean, how much you narrow down the description so eventually only a single person can apply. But is it not also, I wouldn't say that's not the business of the university chancellor. It's a business within our own universities. We have to be much more outspoken many times. I think many times the faculty is much too silent. I would say the other side of the free universities, the faculty has to more open when, when they see something is not, not correct as it should be. I mean, many times our colleague, and then we don't want to, to uh, tell our colleague that maybe we, we, we think this is a bit of narrow to, a too narrow description for a new position. And I think that's maybe part of the other climate to have more of this open discussion within the university. But you know, I mean, coming back to you, Aston, I mean, it's, uh, it's very, ref very, I mean, it feels very good when you see some sort of that free spirit. I mean, I was visiting Technion in Israel and, you know, walking around <coughs> in the physics department, looking at the physics experiments, it was all, it was guided by uh, doing research that we were, you were best doing, but it was also guided by a possibility that the research you actually performed would end up in a, in, in a Nobel, Nobel Prize. I mean, it, that was that type of spirit. There was no talk about strategic areas. Still, I mean, uh, some research, basic research done for uh, for quantum computing. I mean, different uh, realizing that by different uh, solid state physics mechanisms was, I mean, was of course some of the best research I've seen. And uh, I would like to have a university in that spirit not 22 strategic areas that the industry think they would fit them perfect. But we will, we will have them. Okay. Uh, Anders, I'm coming back to this uh, new money, speculative money. You, there has been a difference in the factor for the technical universities and natural science, I mean, one to yeah. 1.5. What, what, what's your comment on, on that? Because that has been widely discussed at Kate Asia, as I understand. Well, let's put it, let, let's make a serious joke about it. Uh, I think that those factors didn't exist. I mean, it was the same factor for natural science, for uh, uh, engineering, for medicine, and for uh, humanities and social sciences. <laughs> then, uh, when uh, when the government saw what would happen with these twenty-two strategic areas, which they had promised that they should be in medicine engineering and, uh, and climate, uh, uh, they discovered, of course, that uh, those three areas were getting much more money than any other. So then they had to find a mechanism to, uh, to increase. Uh, so then they, they said that uh, natural science would get the factor 1.5 uh, extra uh, compared to engineering and medicine and humanities and social science. So it was a pure, it's not, it's not any logic behind it. It's just that they recalculated and then they said, well, now it looks better. Yeah. Here so you can sit in the same corridor or do the same thing and get different factors. Yeah, it is a problem, of course, yeah, at the uh, KTH like and, this, yeah. uh, and uh, Stockholm yeah. University. It's a problem at Chalmers and, mm -hmm. uh, and Gustafsson yeah. University. You sit in the same corridor and Be you're paid 1.5 more. Yeah. It had been better, I believe, if they said that uh, natural science is so important and gets so little this money, so they will get 500 million crowns per year extra <coughs> for natural science as a strategic area. I think that's been much more fair, I mean, in, in And also the basic sciences at the technical universities yeah. could apply, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So. But still, one... Uh, what's the proverb in English? You shouldn't look uh, a horse in a mouse. I mean, uh, so I mean, if you get more money, you should be still be a bit pleased about it. And uh, 
Well, you form a collaboration with your correspondence at Stockholm University and then you share it and you have a fact of 1.25 each of it. <laughs> I'm worried that we're creating a system where we don't see the quality of the individual uh, scientists as well as we have done in the past. I think yeah. that's the, we are, you're calling that we are now getting a quality based way of but it's also that we don't, we'll, this will be in huge chunks and big constellations that not, may not be, be natural. Um, I think it's, a, it's the, the peer review process of individual grant holders, I think is essential for maintaining the quality. Yeah. And these two criteria, according to which money will be based, all external money and bibliometric data, the first one, all external money, one can question how much, how well it's quality based. I would have uh, to include all external money. Uh, but also the bibliometric analysis. What, something I think one should think about is what are the long term effects on science from using such a system. We're, we will certainly adapt to that and we will uh, maximize the output <coughs> in the long run. Uh, and Something that's very important to science is, is risk taking. You have to have a system where people are willing to take risks, spend a lot of time on hard problems and so on. Uh, I don't think these systems do that. Um, I think it would have been much better to put more money into the research council, letting the structure that exists give also larger grants, because that I think is needed sometimes. The, the structures that exist should be able to give grants the order of say three, four million million Swedish crowns a year groups. That I think would have a more, much more efficient way of using it. No, I, 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 I agree and I think the logic was kind of that uh, you, had the you had the research concepts with the individual grants, they were moving into uh, block grants in a way, I mean we get the linear grants and uh, that part of it. Which uh, I also agree with you, it was a necessity for certain areas to be able to, to prosper. And then you have this uh, faculty money which is more for the university infrastructure. And I think the government uh, simply, they simply believe that you could divide up life in individual block grants, area grants, and free uh, and university grants. It was sort of a of a chain of different funding mechanisms and, uh, and uh, the debate if we need these area grants which they will become, uh, if that's a, a good or not so good way, uh, I mean, has, it's, very, it's very hard to debate I mean, uh, until we see the effects, but, uh, but of course when an area will get so much more money called a strategic area, it will. Uh, it is a chance that very much of the research will be channeled into these areas, and they are. They are, not, as Austin points out, they are not the areas that are fostering uh, the freest uh, science. I mean, uh, and maybe not the important thing for the future. But it's also dangerous to grow fast in some areas. Yeah. If you want to improve something, you should grow slowly. But you know, uh, if you go out to the papers today and say we shouldn't have uh, automotive industry as a strategic area, then uh, you will get uh, a full paper of uh, people answering you that uh, you are uh, you are you are not uh, supporting uh, your country. I mean, so it, it's. Uh, but uh, I mean, the, the centers of excellence, for instance, is there any measurement of, of the impact? I, mean, I think I, I agree completely with, with what Anders says. So that the other number is if you have significant grants to excellent individual researchers and it's beneficial for their research to team up, that, then they would do so and it, it will have a significant impact. But by teaming up groups just because you can apply for significant money, I mean, that's a waste. Well, to a certain extent, but when I see some of the excellent centers, I see uh, in some cases some uh, 
some very good scientific leadership, uh, which really promoting the teaming up for doing a good, uh, which gaining all of the people in the excellence centers. But I also see excellence centers where people are being teaming up to just get the money and share it and go home and do uh, uh, what they've always done. So, I mean, and, and I see uh, I see excellent centers that really have no no valid scientific ideas. So, uh, so I don't I don't want to rule out excellent centers as a good mo model for a certain uh, for certain research. But no, but they, but they should grow. I mean, they they, they should attract. I mean, the, the, the danger here is that young people have to join in order to uh, and conform to yeah. ideas yeah. in order to get some share of the home. Yeah, no, I mean, you still uh, have that memory as a young scientist. I mean, when I, the, the, the peer review committee on uh, uh, NFR, I mean, VR for Natural Science, that gave me my, my first grant. I mean, I will always remember these guys and girls in that committee because that was, and that was, I think, I got 30,000 Swedish crowns, which was uh, one per, no, less, much less than 1% of the research group budget. But it was actually someone uh, pointing at me and saying that we believe that you're a bit, ex you're excellent enough to, or doing good enough to be able to, to start your own. So, and if you, or, so I mean, of course, uh, the renewal is very much in the hands of uh, the leadership of these uh, excellent centers if it's going to happen. Uh, I really do think that uh, it's important to measure the quality of science, uh, to measure citation and so on. Uh, that's, if, if you look at the good universities, that's where you see uh, people with good citation index. Uh, of course, not everybody there are good, but uh, a majority is good. And uh, to say that we should not measure it means that probably that we get universities with low quality. When we do this uh, research assessment and the universities do not even want to publish the results because it's embarrassing, uh, it's already a measure that uh, the university is not at a very good standard. And uh, when it comes to this about uh, announcing positions, if you have a management at the university who have any ambition, they should of course see that all the positions are announced openly and not on the local web pages at the departments. Because of course, you have a guy you want to employ, this guy might be good for you, but it's not sure that it's good for the university. But you support your own activities by employing a guy who can do the job for you. But that's not good for your university. No, I mean, I think, uh, I think we all agree upon that the bibliometrics has a very sobering effect. I mean, that it, put, it gives you an idea, I mean, are you doing good or, or well? I mean, I think the, the problem is when you're going to use it for actually distributing money. I mean, uh, I mean that, then it becomes a bit more tricky to use it. But really learning about the status of yourself <coughs> and uh, all this. And I'm, I'm no... Uh, I'm no an expert in a, for a professorship in Uppsala. It, uh, it was five years since I did it last time, and now all the people uh, applying for these professorships are using what's called the age, age index. And I have no idea what an age index is, but it, uh, evidently it's very, very important uh, to have an age index. And uh, so, I mean, we all adapt to this type of. Type of uh, well, algorithms uh, and look upon them as uh, truths. I mean, I mean, if you don't do a good job, you don't want to be compared with your colleagues. But we all want our kids at school to get grades, right? So yeah. they can get in at the best education. Yeah. But I don't want to be national, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have to be very careful. I think the geometrics. It's, a, it's, a, it's very important, but it's important within a group and within an age group. I mean, the age is for the Tirsch in this, but it could equally well be age, as in Pavlovia, because things accumulate. But mathematicians never cite each other, 
So the consequence would be that no university would have mathematics in research. <laughs> you, have to, you have to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess this is, uh, I mean, it is, uh, of course, a culture problem. I mean, using uh, bibliometrics, and, uh, that's, so, so you can do it, I mean, with a limited scope. But uh, I think we will see much more of bibliometrics. I mean, if you look at all these ranking lists we are seeing for uh, telling us uh, uh, which are the great universities, uh, there is always a, a component of uh, bibliometrics uh, in it. So, so I think we, it's here to stay, I mean, definitely. So some of the research money is, uh, well, most of the research money, of course, is being spent on good scientists who produce good bibliometrics. Bibli yeah. bibli and my question now is, uh, if you actually now say you have another box uh, for climate and another box for energy, yeah. and another box for IT, uh, how much, uh, do you know anything about how much uh, bibliometrics uh, the group of climate researchers are producing if you put, if you, if you renormalize this with respect to the amount of money that you're putting in? Yeah, that's a good question. No, I have no idea. I, I believe that, that uh, I think one of the reasons for the strategic areas is possibly that in, in a bibliometrics or in the money you have gained, uh, the external money, it's sort of a way of telling how good you've been in earlier in your career why when you make a choice of a strategic area you at least point at something where you want to be good at in the future so so and i believe that some of the areas chosen i mean for this strategic they are not very good in bibliometrics i don't think uh, many of the climate is uh, one of the strategic areas is space physics i don't i it, i think there is some uh, space physics doing uh, a good bibliometric, I think a lot of space physics is not very productive in that sense. So, so, so we need a measure, or we need also have some ideas what should be good in the in in the future, and uh, and then it becomes strategic in a sense when you when you put it together. I mean, when Austin talk about free. He is strategic for himself. I mean, the, that's a, when we talk about strategic areas, you have 15 of us that uh, decide upon, uh, uh, upon a future direction. And uh, that's, of course, different. Mm. I mean, climate is, of course, a great topic to promote science <coughs> as such. Yeah. <laughs> Could discuss which one. You should have a colloquium on climate, climate, climate because yes, yeah. Yeah, and actually was giving a talk about one and a half years ago. That's yet another question. Yes. Um, universities have uh, traditionally had very big difficulties in changing the faculty funding. It is the same year after year, so we are just bad. Is it discussed somewhere uh, on, from the government side to implement methods to force the universities to do this? Yes, I believe that uh, those, uh, when we talk about these strategic areas, they will be uh, the tool for doing it because uh, uh, I think they are, uh, they have a certain lifetime, but they will definitely after that lifetime to a certain extent be free faculty money. And of course it would take a while before uh, a rector dares to change it from that area, so then you have uh, accomplished a change towards certain areas, uh, new areas. So, the, my worry was that when you look at those strategic areas, they are, as you said, dictated by what is going on right now. Yeah. And, and different special interest groups have involved with them. And so, it's more of the same. Thing. Um, what I was asked looking for was actually some pressure from the government for the rectors to actually do some rearrangements. Yeah, no, I think you. Uh, I don't heads. think the government dares to do it. I think okay. you. I think the only way you can uh, get that to happen is uh, when you elect uh, or select new rectors that you you dare to appoint or select to elect rectors that you know are unreliable in the in this sense I mean that they could change.
<laughs> There's too much reliability in Sweden. Uh, <laughs> Thanks very much, Anders. It was a great opportunity to.